So the two examples uh, for catalysis that we are going to talk about, the first one is a catalytic converter. Okay, so in every car and automobile nowadays are catalytic converters. Okay, so what they do is they use uh, some type of catalyst, catalytic, to convert usually pollutants into less, much less harmful stuff. So like nitrogen monoxide, carbon monoxide, those are pollutants, very toxic, uh, produce those, convert those to nitrogen and carbon dioxide. Uh, so that's a fuel fragment, okay, so unburnt gasoline that doesn't go from, so a lot of times you'll hear complete combustion, you know, uh, you have some type of hydrocarbon plus oxygen goes to CO2 and water. That's called complete combustion. Of course, in real life, we don't always have complete combustion. We have incomplete combustion, so you have fuel fragments. Right? Um, and that leads to, well, it's, it's a pollutant. It's not very good for you, but it also leads to things like smog, you know, in metropolitan areas. You know, with, uh, Again, a bigger problem in like the 70s and 80s was smog because of uh, you know, car exhaust, uh, catalytic converters, uh, clean that up quite a bit. Okay. So we're going to talk about what the catalyst is and how it's going to um, stabilize the reactive intermediates, and we're going to do it by watching a movie. Movie day. All right. So what happens is that platinum. Okay. So let's say that's <coughs> platinum metal. All right. And that oxygen atom sitting there binding to that, it's absorbing, it's just sitting on top, is stabilized by the electrons in those platinum atoms, okay? So that oxygen atom really wants two more electrons to get to the octet rule, right? And normally that's why it reacts with everything and why it's going to be O2. But the platinum's electrons stabilize that oxygen atom so that it can sit there and be by itself, okay? So oxygen is just sitting on top of it, it's kind of like feeling those electrons for those platinum atoms and stabilizing it until something else comes along and oxygen combines <coughs> it like another oxygen atom. Two of those single oxygen atoms uh, find each other, they'll share uh, two pairs of electrons, form that double bond, suddenly it's an oxygen molecule, much more uh, stable and it leaves, okay? So that's how the catalytic converters stabilize those reactive intermediates, okay? That oxygen atom that normally wouldn't exist can sit there for a while until something comes along to react with it. Yes? It's like an untrue temporary bond. Yeah, so it's not really a chemical bond, so it's not forming a bond with the platinum, but it is getting close enough that those electrons can stabilize it. And they, yeah. But they wouldn't um, share orbitals? They wouldn't share orbitals, at least I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, and. Um, so platinum stable enough that it's not going to give up its electrons, okay? Um, that is a good question, whether orbitals overlap or not. Um, but it's not a true uh, chemical bond, so they should be. I, don't, I wouldn't think they do, but I don't know for sure, okay? But that does tell us uh, why we have to use such expensive metals like platinum and palladium, okay? If that was any other metal, like... It would oxidize it. Oxygen would just take those two electrons, be O2 minus. If that was nickel or iron or anything like that, oxygen would just react it away. But platinum is really stable, not going to give up its electrons very easily, not even to an oxygen atom. Okay, so an oxygen atom can sit there, platinum safe, until not something else comes and reacts away that oxygen. Yes? And those metals are good for years and years, 20, 30 years down the line. Yeah, generally platinum and palladium and rhodium are very, very stable. And they're, they're often, sometimes you'll hear them called noble metals, like noble gases. These are so unreactive. And they're some of the only uh, metals that you find naturally occurring in nature, naturally occurring in nature. Yeah. That, that's, those are words that uh, get put together never. Okay? That you'll find them as their pure substance. Like you can mine gold and silver and platinum and palladium. Every other metals with minerals. Okay, so it's you know iron oxide, you know some type of um, compound. Okay? But yeah, they generally are stable. And that's of course why they're used for things like jewelry because they're really you know they don't react away gold and platinum. Okay. All right, so that's one way 
uh, a catalyst can stabilize a high potential energy transition state, um, and that's for the catalytic converters. Uh, the other example <coughs> that uh, uh, your book talks about and we'll talk about, a uh, slightly di different mechanism, but a really important class of uh, catalysts are enzymes, okay? So an enzyme, okay, which you probably, or it's written down here, I'll probably write it here, is a protein that catalyzes biological reactions or biochemical reactions. And uh, this turns out to be a really important class of biological molecules, enzymes. Enzymes do a lot of work in your body. Okay? They're involved in pretty much, I don't know, almost every you know, phase of you know, biological system. They're involved in metabolism, breaking down molecules. They're involved in building up molecules, building DNA, building proteins uh, themselves. Uh, they're, they're, they're used quite a bit, okay? <coughs> and so, uh, how an enzyme usually works is the substrate, which is the reactant, binds to the enzyme's active site. So it's a, a really a similar case to that oxygen binding to the metals or those other molecules binding to the metals in the catalytic converter. Uh, the substrate direct molecules bind to one specific area. I guess unlike the metals, they do bind to one specific area called the active site. And then they form a complex. So again, they're not really forming a true chemical bond. They're sort of just binding there, usually through intermolecular forces. Not usually, always through intermolecular forces. Um, which I usually <coughs> use <coughs> excuse me, um, as an example of why intermolecular forces, you know, something we talked about in Gen Chem 1, uh, are very important. So uh, the two models uh, for enzyme substrate complexes or enzyme active sites uh, that you might learn in a biology class is the lock and key model, okay, where the substrate fits exactly into the active site, kind of like a key into a lock, and it's a perfect fit, and that's what, what uh, fits in that active site, and so that's what gets, you know, catalyzed by the enzyme. The other uh, model is called the induced fit model, where the protein, the enzyme, and or, either or, the substrate kind of change shape so that they fit together. So as the substrate gets closer to the active site, the enzyme will change shape a little bit, so that's a perfect fit, and that's all triggered by intermolecular forces, like hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole forces, all that kind of stuff. All right, but anyways, then uh, the reaction happens, and it happens in a much uh, faster uh, rate because it's being catalyzed, okay? So here's uh, uh, one good example, okay? Uh, so if you eat sucrose, okay, um, if you're you know, drinking a soda, or coffee, tea, do you have sugar in your tea? No, I don't. No. Does anybody have sugar in your drinks? No. Okay, right now? Okay. So sugar, uh, you, know, you, might, you know, it's in lots of drinks, you add to your coffee, or it's in sodas and things like that. Um, it turns out that our body uses water to break down sucrose. So sucrose is a disaccharide, so it's two uh, monosaccharides glucose and fructose. And of course, we want to use glucose for uh, cellular respiration. We use fructose as well, but we want to break that down. We want to break down sucrose. And we actually, most of the time, if we're going to metabolize a uh, carbohydrate or a bigger molecule or like a lipid, we uh, break it down by using water. Okay, so it's called a hydrolysis reaction. So this is called a glycosidic bond. And so you break that carbon oxygen bond and on the carbon, you put an OH, and on that oxygen, you put the other H. So that's where the water comes in. It's OH on the carbon, and the other hydrogen on the uh, oxygen. Okay, so it's called a hydrolysis reaction. So it turns out that sucrose, if it's in your drink, it's surrounded by water, right? 
Because as I taught you, so I'm so wise, there's a lot of water in water, right? And so there's lots of water banging into that sucrose all the time in your drink, but that sucrose is never gonna break down in your drink, okay? It can sit in your drink for years and years and years and it won't break down into glucose and fructose, okay? Because for it to happen, <coughs> that glycosidic bond needs to be weakened, okay? Basically, you gotta bend that bond, okay? So that water can come in and react with it. And that turns out to be really high potential energy. That bond is just not gonna bend like that and just swallow, swim around in your drink. But when it fits in the active site of the enzyme that catalyzes it, and it's called sucrase, so a lot of times enzymes will end in ASE, and they try to tell you what they're doing. So sucrase is the enzyme that breaks down sucrose. Okay? So while it's in the active site and surrounded by that big enzyme, it can bend and strain that bond, but it's stabilized by being surrounded by the enzyme. And so then water comes in, reacts with that, and what's uh, nice about that, once that molecule reacts with water, suddenly it's glucose and fructose and it has different intermolecular forces. So it's uh, attracted to that uh, active site differently. And it turns out usually that a little bit weaker and so it can leave the active site. And then guess what? If that enzyme is still good, it can catalyze another sucrose molecule. And so that enzyme's not being used up it can catalyze lots and lots and lots of sucrose molecules uh, 